This week, James and I interview Galen Hunt, Distinguished Engineer and Director at Microsoft. In the news, React patches a server-side vulnerability, Epic Games teaches people to sideload Fortnite onto their Android devices, and the cost of JavaScript. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. Layered Insight is the industry's first embedded security approach for containers. Trusted by Global 1000 Enterprises to secure their containerized applications, it's the only solution that requires no root privileges, has zero dependency on the underlying infrastructure, and is fully portable across any container environment. Unify DevOps and SecOps, enabling the rapid development of containerized applications without worrying about security. To learn more, please visit layeredinsight.com forward slash ASW. Rapid7 powers the practice of SecOps. Using shared data, analytics, and automated workflows, SecOps unites IT, DevOps, and security teams to make security an outcome of innovation. Rapid7 combines technology, expertise, and advocacy to drive vulnerability management, application security, incident detection, and log management for more than 7,000 organizations worldwide. Power up your SecOps practice with a free trial at rapid7.com forward slash security weekly. Hard-coded credentials can be trouble, but not as much trouble as a vulnerable DevOps environment. If you want protection without the hassle of security slowing you down, CyberArk, the number one provider in privilege access security, has the solution for you. With CyberArk Conjure, developers can easily secure secrets across any DevOps toolchain or platform, whether your application runs in the cloud or on-premises. Eliminate the headaches of managing secrets and try Conjure open source for free with no strings attached. Visit conjure.org forward slash ASW to get started today. Welcome, everyone, to episode 27, our 28th episode of Application Security Weekly. I am, of course, your host, Keith Hoodlett, and I'm wicked excited to be joined by my prolific co-host, James Wicket. Hey there, Keith. Uh, thanks for having me on the show again. Uh, you know, whenever Paul's out, I'm ready to ready to step in. So thank you. Dude, you make an excellent guest host. It, it's so good to have you here. And, and honestly, it's uh, it's going to be a fun time, especially today. Um, before we get into that interview, I do have just a couple of quick announcements for our listeners. First, we have our 2018 listener survey that is still going on. So please go to securityweekly.com slash survey and help us continue to provide you with quality content that doesn't break the build. Uh, other thing I want to announce as well is if you're listening to it at this point and you're just flying out to Vegas, uh, you'll probably catch this afterward. But if you're going to be around the pool cabana at either Black Cat or DEF CON, go say hi to the crew. I'm not going to be there, but Paul and uh, everybody else, Mark and you know Johnny and all the good people at uh, Security Weekly are going to be around, so say hi. Lastly, uh, I'm actually hiring. So at Thermo Fisher Scientific, I've got two openings for application security engineers, both a senior and entry-level role. Uh, those are linked directly in the wiki, uh, so wiki.securityweekly.com for episode 27. Check those out. So uh, moving on, though, I do want to say that we have uh, with us today someone very special uh, to speak with that I'm actually wicked excited to have on the show. Uh, as soon as I heard about this thing called Azure Sphere, I was like, we got to get somebody on. And lo and behold, thank you to the folks at Microsoft, we have Galen Hunt, who led the team in building Azure Sphere, which was announced at RSA earlier this year. Their goal is to make IoT safe for society, and Azure Sphere provides an end-to-end -end solution that enables any device manufacturer to create highly secure devices, possessing all seven properties of seven, or the seven properties, excuse me, of highly secure devices. Galen, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Oh, thank you. I'm just thrilled to be here. Awesome, awesome. So I do want to say for any uh, any folks that want to talk more or listen more to um, kind of the broader discussion around Azure Sphere, uh, Galen, you were on episode 565 of Paul Security Weekly talking about uh, the processor and, and a lot of the thought that went into developing Azure Sphere. So I wanted to focus today's dis uh, discussion and conversation around uh, the platform and some of the things that uh, you know developers might do to to make sure that they're developing secure devices and how they would actually use the platform itself. Um, can you tell us a little bit, just you know, at a high level for our listeners that haven't listened to the episode uh, of Paul Security Weekly, what Azure Sphere is and what you're trying to achieve, and maybe some of the the smaller pieces at a again a high level. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'll try to keep it really high level. So what we're trying to address is the problem of people who are building devices based on MCUs, mic microcontrollers, and allowing them to build devices that are connected to the cloud and highly secured both. Okay. Um, and, you know, in case you don't know, there's about 9 billion uh, MCU-based devices get built and deployed every single year. Most of them, like like 99, 90, somewhere in there percent, are not connected to the internet yet. And we see this um, over the last couple of years. You've seen the introduction of MCUs that have uh, Wi-Fi connectivity or other radios built onto them, and so we see them rapidly over the next few years. All of them becoming connected devices. So, uh, and we as we kind of first found out about these chips at Microsoft, we got really, really excited. Wow, we're going to be able to connect anything for just a couple of dollars to the internet. And then we got really, really scared and like, oh my gosh, those things have no security in them whatsoever. Uh, and because they've just been air gapped in the past, like manufacturers never had to worry about security. So we went about figuring out, well, how do we package all the experience that we have at Microsoft around building highly secure devices? So for example, you know, the experience from the Xbox consoles, for example, um, and some of our other devices and products, how do we package that in a way that any device manufacturer can pick up that platform and build a highly secure device by, by default? Okay, so secure by design. Um, Azure Sphere has three components. Uh, so there's first the Azure Sphere uh, certified MCUs, the chips. Uh, there's an Azure Sphere operating system, and there is an Azure Sphere um, security service. Okay, so let me, let me, I'll just drill into each of them in just a little bit more detail, okay. So the chips, um, these are chips that have, uh, heck, I'll even show you so what some of the chips look like, okay. Let's see if this works. Um, okay, so here's a tray full of Azure Sphere certified chips. Each one of these has got Wi-Fi on it, a full processor, everything. Um, these are microcontrollers designed to go into uh, a device and make it highly secure. And each of these microcontrollers had an, has an IP block. Okay, so for those of you that aren't used to building chips, an IP block is the silicon equivalent of a code library. Okay, we have a code library, an IP block, that provides a hardware root of trust that, that goes into every single one of these chips, regardless of which of our partners makes those chips. And, we, and we're licensing that IP block royalty free to those chip manufacturers so that they can all build these highly secured chips. Then the operating system, uh, the thing, the, the tagline that always gets everybody, uh, draws their attention on the operating system is, uh, it is a, a multi-layer defense and depth operating system with the second layer being a Linux a custom Linux kernel. So we've married in this operating system the best of open source software and the best of Microsoft security software and brought them together to create a new IoT oriented operating system that runs on these devices. Uh, and then the, the security service does three critical things. Uh, effectively, it's reaching out, connecting with every Azure Sphere, well, actually, it's the other way around. Every Azure Sphere device reaches out, connects to the security service. And the security service does three things. It provides uh, software updates so we can renew the devices as new security vulnerabilities are, uh, are come to our awareness. We'll make fixes and we'll and we'll update the operating system on all those devices. Also, through that channel, the the device manufacturer can update their application on the devices securely. The device, uh, the security service also provides. Uh, certificate-based authentication. So the idea is that no Azure Sphere-based device will have passwords ever again. They'll use certificate-based authentication, which is the same kind of device-to-device uh, -device authentication we use uh, in enterprise environments. And then the third thing that the security system does is it monitors all these devices for failures and, and anomalous behaviors and collects reports about that and, and allows us on the back end to analyze the behavior of the devices and this gives us an early warning system for new security vulnerabilities or new security exploits as they come into the, into the area. So that's at a high level what the, what the platform looks like. That's awesome. And so when it comes to the, the platform itself and you're managing it, I imagine that you're obviously giving folks visibility into uh, devices that may be pr producing problems, right? So maybe they've got a, a vulnerability that's in existence. When you're going about um, actually trying to remediate, so like, what is that, that process like? So you, you've got a vulnerable device, 
you now need to push some sort of software update to it. Um, is that kind of from the centralized platform view or is that happening uh, automatically? Can you have it happen automatically? How does that process roll out? So what we will anticipate, okay, based on our experience in other platforms, you know, what we tend to see is when someone's attacking a device, they'll cause, you know, they'll cause crashes, they'll cause other, cause other anomalous behaviors. So we collect those, we bring them back to Microsoft, we analyze them. And when we have some machine learning back end that we look at those crash, that information, and we figure out, okay, is there a vulnerability? Is this just, you know, uh, maybe it's, you know, maybe there's a hardware failure, okay? In that case, we rule it out, we don't have to worry about it. Um, but maybe there's something that, it'll, you know, we look at it and say, this looks like it might be a, a security vulnerability, something in the software. So then we will create, particularly if it's in the, in the in the operating at the operating system level, we'll figure out can we mitigate it in the operating system, um, which is usually the case. You know, we'll figure, out, oh, you know, we need to filter some packets or we need to fix a buffer overrun or something like that. We'll make the modifications in the operating system, and then we will push that operating system out to all the devices that that new update out to all the devices. Uh, and this is one of the, uh, you know, we stopped, talk about the app platform and development. One of the important things we've done for the first time in MCU-based devices with Azure Sphere is we've created a separation of concerns between the device manufacturer and micro, the OS vendor, okay, so that we can update the, the operating system on those devices and we can fix, address security vulnerabilities on those devices without perturbing the device manufacturer's code and without them having to be in the loop. So, you know, you don't have to worry about, oh, you know, I bought it. Also, the the goal we're after is that, you know, from a consumer perspective, if you buy a device, it's an Azure Sphere based device, you know that regardless of how um, security aware or quick responding your OEM is, that Microsoft has got your back. We're going to update those devices and push those updates out automatically to devices so that we keep them fully secured. How does that extend to, like, at the application, like, is that same failure reporting uh, layer available to, like, the application developers uh, that are building on, on the platform? And, like, yeah. where's the, where's that, um, because uh, as you say that, I'm like, I'm pretty excited about that. But then is, yeah. that, is that just so, under Microsoft's purview? Is that under uh, no, so, purview? No, so well? ultimately it applies for the applications as well, right? Um, and the opposite, the intellectual background for this, not the code per se, but the, the intellectual background, is Windows error reporting. This thing that we've had in Windows for about 15 years, where, you know, when your application crashes in the old days, you know, we pop up a dialogue and say, hey, is it okay if we collect this error report and send this to Microsoft? And that's, and so we can do the same thing, only here it's, you know, you kind of opt into it with the device. But we do it for the apps. We'll do it for, hopefully. It's not in the private preview right now, okay, but it's on the roadmap where this is available for the applications as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Microsoft has trained us to just say, yeah, just take it. Send us. Send oh, the yeah. data up. Right. But uh, it's good to hear that's kind of coming back in that that feedback loop uh, on, on both sides there. So it's great. Yeah. Well, and we find it. You know, we. Um, I actually authored a paper. I don't know about eight years ago or something on the Windows error reporting, kind of explaining how that system worked and everything we learned from it. And one of the things we learned that it was just so critical to have that closed feedback loop, right? So you could, so when something went wrong on the device, no matter how rare it was, that we were still getting information about it. Hmm. Is that what, so, so when you went through this list, like, uh, or when you kind of were breaking down the Azure Sphere uh, platform, um, uh -huh. we have the, those seven properties of highly secure devices. Now, did that, did the list inform kind of how you chose to build out the, the platform or was it was it uh, vice versa? How come there's not eight? I don't know. What, <laughs> how, did you, how did you put all this uh, together? That's a great question. Um, the, the, uh, okay, there, there are more properties, okay? Um, well, the, Steve, okay. Stephen Covey has trained us also the, to think in seven. Yeah, so yeah, we're okay happens. with that, we're okay. Um, we, in creating that list, opposite, what we did is we actually kind of looked at everything that we had at Microsoft and said, okay, what would we have to have in order to build devices that were highly secured? Okay. And you know, the way, and I'll put it the, the, you want to have a, build a device that a consumer could know, hey, I've got this device in my environment or, you know, whether I'm an enterprise or consumer, whatever, and I can trust that device that it's not going to be hacked. And how do I, and what's the minimum set of requirements to create that? And that's where we came up with seven properties. Uh, and by the way, we use the term properties because and it's really important to me because a property is something you can measure. 
Okay, it wasn't a you know an ideal that we were trying to use as we developed. It's like we can actually get down and look at the code and say, okay, does this device have these prop this property? Uh, so the properties came before the platform, and then the platform was well, what do we have to what do we have to do at each of the levels in the silicon, in the software, and in the cloud in order to achieve all seven of those properties? Um, now, I'll give you an example, by the way, I'll give you an example of an eighth property, one that we don't have yet, but we, but we envision adding at some point in the future. This is a property called um, cy uh, Trusted Cyber Physical Systems. And so this is the, uh, the ability to have uh, the, the device application be signed and sealed off and protected independent of the OS so that this, you can control, have the safety critical portions of the device be completely separated from the OS. And this is a property we envision some scenarios wanting and, and something that we we'll want to support in the, pro, in the platform later on. But uh, the way I will say it is, you don't want to have anything that has less than those seven properties. That, that's a good way to boil it down. And I know a number of people that are going to be really excited by uh, that eighth property at, you know, at some point when it does get added. Um, I'm thinking of Josh Corman right away, who would probably be jumping out of his seat if he heard that. So um, let me also ask, so when you actually update the MCU, uh, you know, or update the operating system, um, because we're talking about safety critical devices here for a moment, does it Based on those chipsets, does that actually require like a, a hardware reset? So it actually causes like a, a, a restart to take effect? Or is that something that, uh, you know, it kind of like patches live, like in memory patching? Because uh, I imagine there are some listeners that are thinking, you know, oh, you're going to be pushing up patches, but I have no control over when necessarily you're pushing up patches and availability might be a concern. Yeah. So in the in the current version of the product, uh, the patching is uh, it it's not you have to reboot to complete a patch, okay, to complete an update. Um, but the download and having that staged can be done at any point. So you have everything staged, and then you wait, and then we wait for a point where the device is available to do a reboot. You know, so for example, you know, if it's your dishwasher, it's not going to do it in the middle of the dishwashing load because that that would not be very good, right? But you can wait till you know till the end of the load, and then have it, the device do a quick reboot, for example. Awesome. So it's almost like an if this, then that scenario where you can kind of like pre-configure, you know, re good reboot times or things like that. And maybe I get to, you know, like developer, right? Does the developer actually have some control over that process when they're writing the code to say, you know, this is a ideal state for the MCU to be in before a restart occurs? And then that's what we're looking for is the develop, you know, so, so it can, they can't put it off indefinitely, but, you know, they can delay it for some amount of time till the device gets to a, a, a a state where it's good to do that update. Awesome. Now, as a developer, I imagine that, you know, with the chipset itself, there's probably an API that they're making use of. Like, how does, so first of all, can they use Visual Studio Code or is it full Visual Studio that they have to be editing in to, to do this? And secondly, if they can use VS Code, uh, awesome. I'm a huge fan of VS Code myself. Uh, but then uh, from there, like, how do they actually interact with the MCU um, in ways that allow them to kind of program the devices? Yeah. All right. Well, I love the love VS Code. Uh, we we hear lots of really positive things about it. For now, with Azure Sphere, you have to full, use the full Visual Studio. Okay. Um, okay. But what we have it we have a uh, there's a an extension that you so when you when you get a developer kit, you install this extension into your Visual Studio that adds adds Azure Sphere support. And you go and you create a new project, and it pre-populates the project with the base code for for an Azure Sphere application. And you know, there's a set of APIs. Uh, they're very POSIX-like APIs. Uh, you know, specifically, people who program Linux will be very, very comfortable in this environment. Okay, uh, and you write your code, and then you hit F5, and it deploys on uh, onto the device. Okay, and you get a full debugging. I'm sorry, I'm really, really proud of what the team has done with the development experience. Because uh, you know, if you've ever programmed an MCU before, uh, the way I'd commonly describe it is the development experience is very grounded in the 1970s. Okay, uh, <laughs> and and so you can get rid of the disco pants if you want to, and start programming you with the full richness of Visual Studio. And that that's what we're really trying to do is bring the productivity options that Visual Studio has, but you've got full interactive debugging on the device and everything. It's really great experience. 
Awesome. Now, will you ever be developing functionality for this with VS Code? Just maybe? <laughs> wow. wow. Uh, I'll, I'm not going to make a commitment. <laughs> OK. Oh, uh, fair, I, fair. I, I will say this. Um, we early thought that it might be a requirement. What we found is we went out and talked to customers that uh, once we really showed them what the full Visual Studio experience was like, that it was pretty darn compelling. And obviously, once we show them full Visual Studio, uh, in practice, we haven't had very many people say, oh, you know, I just need visual code, and then I'll be happy. But, you know, eventually we'll have I'm to I'm thinking more for, like, the, the, the tinkerers, right? Like, so the, the folks that are kind of doing the one-off, buy the chip, like, you know, building yeah. a, maybe a small robot yeah. or doing, like, a, you know, something where they can do a project with their kids, right? And there will be a lot of folks, especially listeners of this show and of Paul Security Weekly, that uh, that will love to jump in on that, so... Um, James, do you have additional questions as well? I do have my five questions, of course, but I want to hold off on those until yeah. uh, until we get all of our good questions in. Yeah. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about the um, like what kind of assurance does do people have when they're putting this out there? Like, is there some sort of like uh, you know people go to market and they've they've built something um, using the, uh, the the platform? Is there like uh, additional you know like what, like what kind of assurance do they have to give to other people? What what uh, for for their customers? How does that how do you guys see that working? Like, is there some like, you know, uh, like Microsoft approved type uh, type type branding, or, or what, what's going on there? Uh, okay, so we're 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 still kind of working through what the the consumer oriented branding too. As we've talked about it, um, what we what we, the, our our thoughts right now are that what customers really want to do is look for: Do I have a device that is highly secured? Okay, it's really think about it, a labeling standard is kind of more what, where we see you know like a seven properties label. I'd love to see, regardless of who te what technology is in underneath the device, for a consumer to be able to go buy an IoT device and have it and see a, a label on it that tells them what what kind of, you know how many of those properties does that device have, and we really want to focus customers on on that am i getting does my device have all the security properties that it needs you know do i look for, you know the set of vitamins or you know whatever else um and then underneath then our our promise is to the device manufacturer that mm. we will give them a that if they use our platform their device is going to have all seven properties and that it's microsoft's responsibility to maintain that device and those seven properties in that device throughout its entire life, uh, its its lifetime, and we typically talk about like a ten year lifetime for a device. That for the for full ten years, any new security vulnerabilities that that come out, Microsoft is going to fix those, and we're going to patch that OS, and we're going to get that that OS out onto those devices globally. And you know, and then there's the, the side thing of if, if there's any vulnerabilities discovered in the application itself or that can only be mitigated in the application, we'll work with the manufacturers and we provide them the channel for them to push their updates out to the devices as well. Okay, so yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, that's the that's kind of the spirit of the question I'm trying to ask because it's a um, we've talked about this in application security world for a while now, and, and it's the idea of kind of making the cereal box uh, type uh, label for software uh, and how you know being able to make a decision based off of um, you know what, you know what kind of libraries are included inside of it, you know how many uh, how much testing was put into it, what kind of engineering rigor was put into it, uh, and uh, and we still struggle with that as kind of software industry as we provide stuff, so it's. Uh, I, I kind of wonder where where consumer consumer demand is. Are consumers getting smarter? Were they going to see this? Is there that that um, yeah. that push? Because I feel that's 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 the thing that makes the change, right? Yeah. Well, and you I like know, the I like the separate. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Gian. Uh, I, I was just going to say, you know, we look at it um, opposite. You know, I'll, I'll often point people when I'm when I'm discussing with manufacturers and talking about device security. I will point them at the. Um, the Mirai botnet attack back in October 2016, right? Uh, you know, and obviously for what I find is for device manufacturers, that was kind of a almost a 9/11 event. Okay, it was once they they really woke up to what the risks of building and secure devices might be, um, and that you know IoT security, device security was something they really needed to care about. Uh, for consumers, it was complete non-event. They never even woke up to it. Uh, and I suspect uh, what we're going to see, and as, uh, as I talk to like people in in government across the industry and things, I suspect what we'll see is some labeling standards start coming out of 
you know, regulatory bodies and pushing it. I, I suspect it's going to be a little stronger there than it is from the consumers immediately. You know, maybe there'll be some um, like enterprise customers where they start to see, hey, we really need to have, you know, we want this kind of labeling standard. We want to see this. But um, I, I just don't see consumers in the near term getting there where they, without a lot of education, where they're demanding the security. Just because I, I don't think a consumer, I'll give you a really simple example. Um, you know, the typical consumer you just tell them, hey, I've got this gas stove that is has is Wi-Fi connectivity so you can remotely set the, te- you know, you can change the temperature of your gas stove. I don't think there's very many customers who immediately jump from there to, oh my gosh, how are you going to assure me that this thing isn't turned into an incendiary device in my house, right? And I, I think there's places where kind of more standards bodies and things are going to have to step in. Yeah, I think to make the cereal box analogy, right, it's like we don't even understand what, you know, vitamins are or calories are or whatever, right? Like consumers don't have that that level yeah. of concept. They wouldn't understand the line items. So, um, yeah. You just but, know you want to have 100%, right? Right. You, do, you know you want right, 100%. Right, right. And you do have the brand recognition of a powerhouse like Microsoft to say, well, this is, you know, secured by Microsoft or some sort of some sort of uh, outside, uh, you know, uh, you know, body, right? So the um, like the, the FDA has served for for consumers, right? So uh, anyway, so it, yeah, I was just I was curious to see how how that approach uh, was. Keith, did you have something else to add on that? I didn't mean to pull in there. No, no, it's quite all right. I, I was going to say I, I'm actually really excited for the the concept or the ideas around the seven properties, like labeling, right? Like it meets these seven properties of highly secure devices, as you know, as the PDF kind of points out and even has the logos associated with it, right? Like you can just kind of like show which properties it covers. uh, And then from there, it's almost like you're, okay, does it have all seven properties? Cool. I want this. Uh, Or what I'm building has five of the seven, but maybe the threat model is a little different. So I only really need those five. Um, Or I need five, but it covers four of the five that I actually need. So um, I did want to get to the the five questions. If you have a couple more minutes, uh, Galen, before we, we let you go. Uh, so this first one, actually, you might enjoy. Uh, what were the specs like on your first computer? <laughs> oh, that's really easy. Apple II Plus, uh, 64K RAM because I had the language card, one megahertz processor, 8-bit, 6502, uh, with uh, one, what's it, 140K floppy disk, I think. Now, I, I joke when I ask, was it internet connected? <laughs> 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 no, it was not internet connected. It was years later before I got my first 300 baud modem. There you go. There you go. So now I have to ask then, because uh, it sounds like maybe uh, you were you were practicing some of the Apple programming early in your early days. What was the first programming language that you learned? AppleSoft Basic. Nice. So now I have to ask, uh, and this probably would have come later, Vim or Emacs? Oh, Emacs. Interesting. I I am I, I, more of a Vim guy, but it, <laughs> interesting. I don't have. I'm not have. Don't have enough brain cells to do Vim. <laughs> so then I have to ask uh, as a as another question then: spaces or tabs? Spaces definitely. Same. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely on the spaces bandwagon. Uh, last question: Who would you nominate as a future guest, or what topic would you like to see us cover on a future episode of Application Security Weekly? <sighs> Is that great? Uh, you know, we have this guy by the name of uh, Jeff Cooperstein at Microsoft. He's one of the Azure security architects. I'll bet you'd have a blast having a conversation with him. Yeah, by all means, if uh, if Chelsea or yourself can broker an introduction, we'd love to have them on. Uh, yeah. So, with as long as he's young... a Vim guy, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he's a Vim guy. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, good. <laughs> we gotta keep I, the balance. Uh, we, we neither, uh, you know, we do not discriminate against our Emacs brethren on this show. With that being said, Galen, thank you so much for joining us in Application Security Weekly. We are going to take a short break and come back for the news. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. Galen.